Thank you very much, Lee. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about you and how you can be brilliant every single day. So big ask. I spent the last 15 years working with some of the best CEOs and executives around the world. And one of my observations is some of them are absolutely fantastic, but the problem is they can't be fantastic every single day. Which reminds me of a story. I was sat on the couch at home watching the TV about five years ago. Um, and not that I'm a golfer, but I was watching uh, the British Open. And uh, a, a very a good golfer called Sergio Garcia was playing. And he'd been brilliant all week, uh, dominating the field. Uh, and it came to the last round, uh, and he was sort of uh, fantastic. And on the Sunday morning in the front nine, uh, he scored 39 shots. And the previous day, on the Saturday, uh, he'd scored 29 shots on exactly the same holes. So overnight, he'd lost 10 shots on the same hole. Uh, so what happened was Porrick Harrington came past him and won the British Open and the, uh, the, uh, the claret jug. Um, and very interestingly, uh, exactly a year later, uh, Porrick Harrington uh, beat Sergio Garcia. Uh, I think it was in the US Masters. Sergio played brilliantly all week. He got to the Sunday, and something went wrong. He was leading the field by six shots. And on the Sunday, again, Porrick Harrington came past him. So that was sort of really interesting to me. Uh, and Peter Alice, the, the famous golf commentator, is watching this and says, it's a funny old game, golf as though it's a complete mystery why these things happen, uh, as there's a complete loss of form. Um, so I'm there shouting at the television, it's no mystery to me. Uh, actually, I know why that happened, uh, and I know uh, why Sergio Garcia, basically between 2007 and 2008, really didn't learn that much, because he made exactly the same mistake in 2008 as he'd made in 2007. So I'm going to share with you uh, the secret about that, um, uh, some of the things that we've been teaching executives, uh, bringing in some neuroscience, which is my background, uh, and uh, going to reveal some secrets as to how your system works. So we're going to go through that, and then I'm going to break with Ted Tradition at the end of the talk, and we're going to have a bit of a live demonstration of something. Um, but I want to just give you the sort of model that we work to uh, that starts to explain why Sergio or anybody uh, may lose performance, or why you may lose performance, and what you need to do to maintain your brilliance every single day. So if we're all after the same goal, uh, we're after improving our performance in some way or the results in some way, and it doesn't really matter what kind of results we're talking about, whether we're talking about sporting results, whether we're talking about business results, uh, you know, academic performance, uh, relationship performance, sexual performance. I don't know why I'm looking at Simon when I, when I say that, but... Uh, <laughs> Whatever we're talking about, so thank you. Uh, what is going to improve our performance? Well, first and foremost, in order to change the result, you've got to focus on people's behavior. So we've got to do things differently in order to get a different result. So most performance appraisals in industry uh, focus on what you've been doing. So you go in and you see your boss, uh, and he said, oh, I've got some 360 data. You know, you've been doing these kind of things. That's really good. These other things, not so good. So a bit less of that, please, and a bit more of that. So I want you to do that and less of that. Uh, and sometimes that actually works, and then you get a different result. But an awful lot of times, it doesn't make much difference. Or it will only make a difference if the leader stood over that employee cracking the whip and making sure they do this. So uh, it's necessary but insufficient. Uh, and the reason being is that even when people know what to do, sometimes they just don't do it. I know I ought to make another 1,000 calls to 1,000 customers, but you know what? It's Friday afternoon. Mm, I'm not going to do that. So it's not enough just to focus on what you can see on the surface, on the behaviors. You've got to really get to grips with what's on the inside of individuals. Why do people do what they do? Uh, if you really want to change performance permanently and be brilliant every single day, you've got to get to grips with the inside. So first and foremost, what's actually driving behavior? It's how people think. So how you think determines what you do. So when I'm coaching a, a CEO, if he thinks I'm an idiot, he's not going to do what I say. Why would he? Or if he thinks what I'm saying is rubbish, he won't do it. So I've got to get a grip uh, of what he thinks about. In fact, that requires me to ask him some questions, which is a, a lot more complicated than just observing the behavior. But our view is if you don't get to grips and start to ask some more detailed questions, you won't get a sustainable change in the results. It won't last. You'll get this variance in performance, this form loss. 
So you've got to get to grips with how people think about you, about what you're saying, about the world. But even if you did, it's not enough. Because there's something more fundamental driving how people think. So how you think is really hugely influenced by how you feel. In fact, these two things affect each other. Thinking affects feeling and feeling affects thinking. It goes back and forward in a loop. But the dominant factor really is feeling. So for a whole bunch of neuroscientific reasons we haven't got time to explain, actually, if you want to change what people do, you've got to change their thinking. If you want to change their thinking, you actually have to change how they feel. This is a much more significant impact on that than the other way around. So if you feel anxious, for example, it's no good me saying to you, don't worry. Right? You'll have experienced that doesn't work. Oh, I'm doing this exam. Don't worry. Oh, do you know what? I haven't thought not to worry. That's the answer then. Oh, not worry. Oh, good. How much was that? There's the check. It doesn't work like that. You've all experienced that if you feel anxious, you feel anxious. And no amount of don't worry is going to help you. In fact, it often makes you worse. All right, you'd say don't worry. I'm worried. So the real active ingredient is you've got to change this. Still not enough. There's something more fundamental driving how you feel, and that is your raw emotion. So you've got to change the emotion in order to change the feeling, in order to change the thinking. Now, you may be sat there wondering, well, hang on a minute, feelings and emotions are the same stuff, isn't it? It is not. Right? So many people don't realize, and particularly many of my own friends in science and medicine, don't realize that feelings and emotions are not the same thing. In fact, many people don't even realize feelings and the thinking are not the same thing, particularly men. Right? <laughs> so you ask many men uh, to tell you how they feel, and they tell you how they think because they don't understand the question. Right? So you can see most of the women in the room nodding, going, that's true, that's true, that's been my experience. And most of the men sat there going, what? What's he talking about? <laughs> These are not the same phenomena. Thinking and feeling are not the same thing. And feelings and emotions are not the same thing. So if you want to change the result by changing the behavior, there are multiple levels. And even if you got to grips with the emotion, still not enough. There is something even more fundamental down here in the basement of the human system is your physiology. So the reason you get variance, like Sergio did in his performance, is there are multiple levels that Sergio Garcia hasn't got control over. He's just con concentrating on his technical putting performance or the way that he drives the ball. And he hasn't got a grip of any of this other stuff. And even if he's telling himself and rehearsing mentally, oh, I'm a good golfer, I'm a good golfer, I'm a good golfer, it's not enough because there's still three levels that he hasn't got a grip of. So if you want to be brilliant every single day, you've got to grip, get a grip of every single level. And that's how you crank out your A game every single day. So let's just work from the back to the top. So if we start with physiology, what is that? That is just simply streams of data. That's all physiology is. It's data streams. So as I'm talking to you right now, most of you are getting streams of data coming into your brain about what's going on in your body. So some of you had the cupcake at the break, and you'll be getting a signal from your gut saying, oh, sugar, we got sugar. And it's coming into your brain, telling your brain what's going on in your gut. Right? Some of you are then getting contractions around that cupcake. So you've got pressure waves being created, telling your brain about what's going on in your gut. So these are all just bits of physiology. So they're just data streams. As some of you might write or type, you've got joint position sense going up the nerve channels into your brain, telling your brain about where your fingers are. They're just bits of physiology. So it's just streams of data, if you will. So what's an emotion? Well, an emotion, if you take all the streams of data, whether it's coming from your gut or your joints, or your heart, or your lungs, if you take the data from all the streams, uh, all the bodily systems, and it comes into your brain is electrical signals, electromagnetic signals, chemical waves, pressure waves, take all of those signals from all of those systems, that's what an emotion is. It's simply energy, E, in motion. That's all an emotion is. So we all have that, even us fellas. We've all got emotions. Every second of every day, there is an energetic state going through us. Because we're constantly digesting, we're constantly breathing in and out, our heart's constantly beating, it's happening all the time. So we've got energy in motion every single second of every single day. But we may not all have feelings. Feelings are the awareness in our mind of that energy. And that's where the problem is. The energy may be there, but we just don't feel it. So, for example, if you take a very common experience of most people, if we look at what is the uh, energetic signature, if you will, of something like anxiety. So, what goes on physiologically when we're in a state of anxiety? If we look at the heart rate, it's fast. 
The heart's going boom, 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 boom. What else is happening? What's happening in the mouth? The mouth's dry, so you're talking as though you've got cotton wool and you can't get the... That's happening. What's happening in the palms of your hand? They're sweaty. What's happening in the gut? It's churning. These are the specific physiological constituents of that thing that you would know as anxiety. And then I ask you, how do you feel? And you say, all right. So all that data's there, you're just not feeling it. And if you're not feeling it, it's altering what you're thinking and how well you're thinking it, which is changing what you're doing. But you don't realize that, because you feel all right. You're not noticing any of that. You're just thinking what you're thinking and doing what you're doing. So what we're saying is that the brilliance every day requires on you to tune in to what's happening down here at the physiological and the emotional level, and not only become aware of that, but get control over it. Because most of you do not have the control at that level. In fact, very few people have got control of any of this stuff on the inside. And you know, even when people have been highly trained on regulating their behavior, even they haven't got that much control over this. So that's the source of your brilliance. If you can get control over the whole thing, you can crank out your A-game every single day. So how do you get control? Well, we've first of all got to start with which bit of the physiology, given that so many different signals, where are we going to start? Well, we're going to start with one specific signal, which is the electrical signal of your heart. So your heart beats. So when your heart beats, ping, 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 ping. If you watch you know, the medical programs, before it goes beep, which it always does, doesn't it? Uh, so the ping is, the heart basically contracts and causes a spike of electricity. And you can measure the distance between each heartbeat. And I don't know whether you know, but the distance between each heartbeat varies <coughs> over time. So if we look at your heart rate over time, we'll see that your heart rate will vary up and down. Like that. And if you go to the doctors, he takes your pulse rate and he says the average is 70. But in taking the average, he's ignoring all the variance, and it's the variance that really matters. Taking the average, you lose all the critical data. That's like listening to Mozart and saying the average is da. Was that Mozart or was it Pearl Jam? Okay, we don't know. So it's the variance or something that's called heart rate variability that's key. Heart rate variability key for three reasons. Number one, it predicts your death. So if I measure your variability for 24 hours, I can tell you when you're going to die. So now I have your attention. <laughs> All right. So we tell, tell this to organizations, do you know what? They don't care. So we can't sell them on that. So the other reason is it predicts, if we measure HRV for 24 hours, it can tell you how much energy you've got, uh, which is sort of interesting to leaders because leaders need lots of energy. But the real reason that they buy and they're interested in this is because HRV alters brain function. So when I put you under pressure, what basically happens to your HRV is it becomes super chaotic. So basically, your brain receives a signal from your heart up the nerve channels, which when under pressure becomes super chaos. The consequence of the super chaos is it shuts off your frontal lobes and you have a DIY lobotomy. <laughs> so under pressure, you lobotomize yourself. It's as though you've suddenly taken the stupid pills and you go, oh, like that. So I thought we'd just show that to you for a live demonstration to show you how easy it is to create chaos in your biology, whether you want it to happen or not. So we need a, uh, a willing volunteer for this moment. So just come and sit in the chair, and I'm going to show you how to be brilliant uh, uh, by showing you your physiology. So we need a volunteer just to come up, if you would. And all we're going to do is just put a little clip on your earlobe. So thank you very much. Give him a round of applause by way of encouragement. Thank you. What's your name? Neil Nelson. So Neil is very kind. He doesn't know idea what we're going to be doing to him, so this is really very brave. Um, so first of all, we're going to make sure Neil is alive. So is his heart beating? So you can see that every time his heart contracts, it squirts blood up into his ears and his ears go red. And between contractions, all the blood drains out and his ears go white. So if you look at the person sitting next to you, you can actually see their ears flashing red, white, red, white. Actually, you can't see that because your eyes aren't sensitive enough. But what this little clip on Neil's ear can see is we can see the change in color his red, his white, his red, his white, his red, his white. So this is a heartbeat. So he's good news now. You're alive, mate. Uh, the heart's beating away. Boom, 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 boom. So the heart's beating. And so what the software does measures the distance between each one of those beats. And based on the distance between this beat and this beat, it calculates its heart rate. It says it's 76. And it calculates it again and again and again and again and again. And you can see that his heart rate's bobbling along about 75 beats per minute. 
So pretty relaxed. Sat in a chair, your heart rate should be doing about 75 beats per minute. Okay, so what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to put him under a little bit of pressure and see how well he copes with that kind of pressure. Are you good under pressure, Neil? Oh, we don't know. Right, we're just about to, we're just about to find that out, aren't we? So let's see how well he does under pressure. Uh, so uh, we haven't started yet, and already his heart rate's kind of creeping up to about 90. So he said, well, what are we going to do here? Um, so uh, we're going to give you some mathematics. How good are you at mathematics? Quite good. Oh, he's quite good. So <laughs> this will be no trouble, right? So can't, oh, look, he thinks he's quite good, but his heart rate's now... <laughs> I'm good. I'm quite good. Right? He's gone off the charts, and now he's... <laughs> He's settling back down, and you can see there's a lot of chaos going through his system right now. So even though he, I'm good at this, that is a natural physiological response to a challenge. You put somebody under pressure, the physiologist, whether he wants it to happen or not. You see, he might look like he's in control. He is not. In fact, I am the puppet master. Right? I'm pulling his strings whether he wants me to do that or not. So at the moment, there's a bit of uncertainty. The physiology is sort of settled around about 80, slightly higher than it was before, because he doesn't know what's going to happen. So let's see how well his brain actually functions under pressure. So let's see how good at that math he really was. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count out loud backwards, subtracting threes. I'm going to start you off at a certain number. I want you to take away three, then give me the answer. Take away three again, give me the answer. Take away another three, give me the answer. And keep going, serial subtractions of threes without making a mistake. And if you make a mistake, it's 50 quid. Okay, so financial penalty for every error. Okay, so uh, is, is that all right with you? Okay, so uh, no, no problem at all. We're going to count out loud backwards, subtracting threes. Uh, the mention of 50 quid, look, the heart rate's crept up here to 120, just the tension in the system. So again, I'm just talking to him. That's all that's happening. And actually, by me just talking to him, a physiology chaos is kicking in, and that's going to be sending a signal from his heart to his brain that's going to be inhibiting his brain function. We'll see that. So as fast as you can, without making a mistake, some serial subtraction of three, starting off at 300. Go, come on. 300. 10. Come on, faster. 286. 275. 284. 273. 286. What? Well done. Give him a round of applause, everybody. So what you can see is, when I started to feed in the wrong answers, uh, 208, uh, what, what? Like, uh, where? you get this, it's called cortical inhibition, or frontal lobe shutdown. So under pressure, the frontal lobe shuts down and the simplest of tasks subtract three from that number. Uh, 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 what? Can't do it. That is happening to all of you when you're under pressure. Right? Your brain is built this way. So one of the things you need to learn to do is to get control of that physiological level and switch from a chaotic signal to what's called coherence. So the thing that, under, that underpins brain function is the ability to generate a coherent signal. So there's variance, but it's stable variance as opposed to wildly fluctuant variance. And that is the source of your brilliance. So thank you very much. Well, this is kind of nice, isn't it? Because 18 minutes is incredibly difficult to contain what you want to say uh, to 18 minutes. Well, it is for me anyway. Um, so we kind of showed you earlier on uh, what goes wrong um, uh, under pressure. So uh, the human brain is constantly getting a signal uh, from all the bodily systems, but particularly the heart, up the vagus nerve, which, as we showed you, was sort of erratic and under pressure, super chaos causes that DIY lobotomy. So you're all built that way, and you'll all have the experience um, when somebody kind of puts a challenge to you, and it doesn't really matter, as you saw, how small that challenge is. And it can be any type of challenge, you know, a challenge to your point of view, a challenge to your ego, uh, a challenge to your relationships. Any type of challenge causes the physiology to go chaotic, causes the frontal lobes to be inhibited, and you become suboptimal straight away. And what's kind of interesting uh, about that is that when the brain's inhibited, uh, it also inhibits your perceptual awareness so you don't realize it's happened. Right? So you can come out of a meeting and think, oh, that went well. And everybody's going, what do you mean that went well? You were rubbish. 
right? But because your awareness is inhibited, you don't realize how rubbish you were, right? So it's a bit of a catch-22. So this is really what the, the phenomena that underpins, uh, you know, lots of different things that you'll have seen and experienced yourself or seen on television. So stage fright. Um, you know, people get stage fright, can't remember their words. Kids go blank in an exam. It's the same phenomena. Um, or, uh, you know, um, my personal favorite, Family Fortunes. If you've ever watched that show, Family Fortunes, and you have the two people sit at the front. We've asked 100 people in the street to name something you put in a jacket potato. Zzz, jam! <laughs> You know, it's hysterical. You know, when your frontal lobe's inhibited, you say anything. You know, and it's really funny. Um, you know, Anne Robinson, The Weakest Link, you know, she throws you a simple question and then stares at you, and you blurt out any old sort of rubbish. So when you're, you know, up with your boss, you know, even if you might be the nicest boss in the world, you know, if you're a little, feel a little bit under pressure, you suddenly discover you're talking rubbish. Right? You can, sometimes you even have that awareness you know, you almost sort of see yourself coming out with the most ridiculous nonsense. to come up with a great idea or how to innovate that sales process or any of that stuff, the quality of your thought, in fact, the very things that you think and how well you think them is hugely influenced by your biology. Right? So I'll give you a couple of live examples and then we'll show you. We'll get Neil back out and we'll show you how to control your physiology. So um, if, you don't, if you haven't yet clocked that your biology is controlling your brain function, uh, if we held you and locked the doors, filled you up with coffee, right, what happens is your bladder gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It starts to send alarm messages to your brain, and you're getting one of these peas, you know. I've got a pee, I've got a pee, I've got a pee. And then if you ever had that experience where you can't get out of the room, but your bladder's going to start an alarm signal, and all of that, and you haven't got pampers on, <laughs> what you'll discover is you go deaf. 
right? You ever notice that? You can't hear people. So you're so internally focused. My butt is going to burst. My butt is going to burst. You go deaf. You can see people's mouths moving, but you can't hear what they're saying, right? Then beads of sweat start to break out. You're trying to pee the urine out through your forehead, <laughs> right? You literally, your consciousness is completely eradicated, right? So that's the biology disrupting your consciousness. Well, I was in a meeting recently with a woman who was eight months pregnant. And, uh, yeah, we were chatting away, and you saw this, the baby visibly ripple across. You know, it went like that. And you could see this ripple go across her abdomen. And she was chat, 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 and then she went, oh. And for about 20 seconds, she was gone. <laughs> Completely kind of left the room. And, and then she went, oh, hello. <laughs> sort of back in the room again. It was like her consciousness had disappeared for 20 seconds. So these are like live examples. You think, you just think, right? But what do you think and why do you think it? So I was talking to a senior exec who's oh, a government think tank, right? I said, oh, a government think tank, oh, that's interesting. You probably sit around with loads of clever people uh, debating the issues of the day and trying to come up with some clever answers. He said, yes, yeah, pretty much what we do. <laughs> uh, I said, have you ever thought about why those answers, not these other answers. Have you ever thought about your own thinking? He said, oh, I never thought about that. I said, well, you're a think tank, and you've never thought about thinking. What's that about? So we just think, but we don't realize that what we think and how well we think it is actually influenced by something else. So thought is really an emergent property within your system. The very things that you think, you will think different things if you're happy than if you're depressed. And how well you think them will depend a lot on the biology. Right? So if you want to step change thinking, if you want to really you know, double or treble the quality of your thinking, you can't do it by thinking about it. Right? Wouldn't that be nice if I said, look, I've spotted the problem for you in your life you're not thinking smart enough, right? So I want you to go away over the weekend, come back 25% smarter on Monday morning. All right. That would be nice, wouldn't it, if you could, oh, you know, I hadn't thought to do that. I'll go away and I'll, I'll think about my thinking over the weekend and 25% better on Monday. Here I am. It doesn't work that way. I mean, that's what Einstein said, isn't it? You, you can't solve the problems with the same level of thinking that created the problems. You need a new level of thinking, but the problem is, how do you get a new level of thinking? You don't get a new level of thinking just by thinking about it. You've got to change the context in which thoughts emerge. You know? To use Chris and Nally, it's the context, which is in, in human terms is the biology. What is the biological context from which thought emerges? What is the emotional state from which thought emerges? You change that context, the biological and emotional context, you can change the quality of the thought and the actual thought itself. That is the source. Okay? So let, I suggest we get Chris back up and I'll show you how Chris can learn, with no training before, how to control his physiology. You do not need to be a, uh, sorry, Neil, a yogic master. <laughs> There we go. Which ear are we on? This one? Uh, yes. All right. If you just hold that. In fact, you can turn your chair around a bit if you like. Just turn your chair around a bit so you can see the screen a bit more easily. So exactly as before, is he still alive? Yeah. So we'll start recording. So again, just picking up each heartbeat. And so the, again, the software is measuring the distance between each heartbeat and calculating his heart rate. Now, because he's just come out of the audience and walked up to the stage, he's going about 90 miles an hour. <laughs> Uh, just the excitement of being at the front here. So if you want to control your physiology, this isn't years and years and months and months of practice. This isn't, you don't have to be a yogic master to control your physiology. You just have to know exactly what to do. All right? So we're now going to show Chris exactly, uh, sorry, Neil, exactly what to do. <laughs> Mental block. So over here is a breath pacer. So when that goes up, I want you to breathe in. And when that goes down, I want you to breathe out. Oh. And at the bottom, there's a hold, so wait for it. Don't go too soon. Ready? And a long, slow. OK, wait for it. A long, slow. And you can follow this in the room if you want. Just breathe in this rhythmic fashion. 
So nice rhythmic breathing. So a long breath in and a long, slow breath out. Okay, so I'll leave Neil to do that and I'll carry on talking to you guys. So of all the things that you can do to get your physiology under control, there are many, many things. Um, but the start point is to do something that you can get conscious control over. And you can get conscious control over your breathing. Now there are 12 different things, different aspects of your breath that you can regulate. 12 different aspects. So when you go to classes, you know, whether it's singing, uh, sports, um, you know, fighter pilots, um, all sorts of things. They'll talk to you about breathing and you know, br breath practice, uh, yoga. You know, um, but what are they teaching you? So for example, there's a yogic practice where they teach you alternate nostril breathing. And that's kind of interesting, but in my view, that's number nine on the list of priorities okay, of the 12. The single most important thing is rhythm, which is what this is training. So we've seen that this measures the level of coherence in Neil's system. So when he's in complete chaos, he's down here in the red. And just with a bit of guidance, in less than or about a minute, he's up and into the coherent green. He is the yogic master. <laughs> Neil brackets Yoda, right? OK, no. Uh, so you can see the physiology has changed from this erratic to this coherent waveform in less than a minute, when you know what to do. So of all the things in your breathing that you can do, if you start to control the rhythm of the breath, that will start to change the physiology, just as you've seen. Right? And you will start to become more coherent. So his frontal lobes will work better now than at the beginning of this trace when his physiology was erratic. You all see the difference? And even though the average heart rate is about the same during that period and during this period, the heart rate is the same, but the pattern is different. So when you change that pattern, you're basically sending better quality fuel from the heart to the brain, and the brain's going to work better. Right? And when the brain works better, you're more perceptive, you're more insightful, you're more clear thinking. You can understand how to problem solve. So as some of the other speakers say, you, know, you have to figure out when things go wrong, what am I going to do about this? Well, if your brain's inhibited, you probably won't come up with the idea or the right answer. But if you've got your brain switched on, you've got a much better chance. Does that all make sense? So uh, when you hear people say to you, uh, oh, you know, before that big presentation, take a few deep breaths, I'd say, don't bother. Because a few deep breaths isn't actually going to alter your brain function that much. And by the way, when they say deep, what they actually mean is large. They mean large volume breaths is what they mean. Because depth is really where the air in the lungs is going. What they mean is a few big breaths. But even volume is only about number five or six on the batting order. The number one priority is rhythm. Take a few rhythmic breaths. That will start to change your physiology. So you can put this to the test. Right? Next time, before you may have to make a difficult phone call, rather than taking a few deep breaths or even a few large breaths, take a few rhythmic breaths. And rhythm really means a fixed ratio of in to out. And it doesn't matter what that ratio is, so long as it's fixed. So this is four seconds in, six seconds out. Four, six, four, six, four, six. You could do five, 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 so long as it's fixed. What you don't want is four, six, five, five, eight, three, three, seven, two, five. That's, that's erratic breathing, OK? You want a fixed ratio. And then once you've got a rhythmic breath going, the second most important thing is smoothness. Because you can breathe rhythmically but staccato, so you could go That's entirely rhythmic, but it's staccato. So what you want is smooth, so which is a fixed volume per second around the entire cycle. Right? So just as we probably both rowers, and my sport was rowing, that's what they teach you. So how the rowers are going to win us all the gold medals in the Olympics in 147 days, thank you. Okay, 151 days. They'll teach you, when you ever learn to row, blades in the water, blades out the water. In, out, in, out. Rhythm, right? And then once you've learned that rhythm as a novice oarsman, the next thing is once the blades are in the water, even smooth pressure through the water. 
right, all the way through the stroke. What you don't want to do is put blades in the water, pull really hard and let it drift a bit, and pull really hard at the end, because the boat will go <laughs> like that. If you're in an even pressure, and the same with Chris Hoy on the bicycle, if you look at the metrics that are done around Chris Hoy, right, so you, I don't know where you realize this, but everybody, when they, novice cyclists think it's just about the kick down, right, but then it's the drag and it's the lift. And actually, it's a circle. So if you look at the metrics on that, they've got to go circular and get as much pressure evenly applied around the whole cycle. So you'll see the Olympic uh, cyclists will have a smooth uh, and even force all the way around the loop. And those are the guys that win the gold medal. So, you know, it's smoothness through it. So exactly as we've got here is if we can, not rather than go, and then go, so he might have rhythm, but as he got smoothness, as he gets smoothness better, he becomes more and more coherent. So rhythm and smoothness, exactly as you would cycle, exactly as you would row, gives you the most powerful effect. Does that all make sense? So one other thing, if we've got time, we probably have. I'm just yakking because we don't have lunch till 1 o'clock, so I might as well tell you something. Um, um, the third most important thing is the location of your attention while you're breathing. Okay, so um, what we say is, you know, people teach oh, a bit of abdominal breathing. You know, breathe through the belly and all of that. So our view is, no, no, breathe through the center of your chest, through the heart area, if you will. Right? Uh, three reasons why we say breathe through here, not breathe through there. Or don't imagine you're sucking the air up through the soles of your feet, or it's coming in through the crown chakra or whatever. You could do any of that stuff. But where is with your attention when you're breathing? We say, put your attention in the center of your chest. Three reasons why you put your attention in the center of your chest uh, is, number one, the heart generates more electrical power than any other part of your system. So even though there are billions of nerve cells up here, right, and only a couple of hundred thousand down here, the power output of your heart is three and a half watts, which is way greater than the power output of your brain. Because what happens in the brain, the electrical charges go in all different directions, it all cancels. Right? But here, you've got something called auto-coherence. So the heart has to synchronize in order for it to pump. So electrically speaking, the heart generates 50 times more electrical output than the brain. If you want to record somebody's brain waves, you have to put a clip on their ear, just as Neil's got here, and pick up the heartbeat. And then you have to mathematically remove the heartbeat, because the heartbeat is this big, and the brain beat, or brain wave, is only that big. So the heart's way more powerful electrically. Electromagnetically, the heart generates 5,000 times more energy than the brain. So it starts to, figure the pun, turn on its head. Hang on, what's controlling what here? All right? You've got to start to look a bit more broadly in terms of the human system as a system. We're so brain-dominant, brain-centric. So if you're putting your attention in the heart, you're putting your attention where the primary source of uh, power is here. Uh, so that's the first reason. Um, you know, the second reason, if you drop your attention and breathe through here, it gets you out of the noise in your head, which is where we're usually confused. <laughs> Just to drop into the body and breathe through the center of your chest. And the third reason, which we're going to get on to, uh, is actually we're ultimately going to go from controlling that physiology up to the emotional state uh, and show you actually how do you turn on the passion, how do you turn on a positive emotional state when an awful lot of our positive emotions are experienced in the center of our chest. Hence, I love my son with all my heart. Why do I even say that? Because that's actually where I feel it. The awareness might be in our mind, but where do we feel the sensation of love in the center of the chest? Right? So where do you clutch the baby? You clutch them to your heart. Right? You don't clutch the baby to your knee. You know? I love my son with all my knee. We don't say that because we don't feel it in our knee. We feel it in the center of our chest. So the very fact that you put your attention on the center of your chest or in the heart area starts to drift you into a slightly more positive state. Does that make sense? So this last thing I want to just, while Neil's impressing you, give you this other bit. So in my view, the big myth of performance, I think, is that it's something to do with adrenaline. You know, you'll see this in business or in sport. You know, if you're not a bit pumped, you won't perform. Go to that meeting, you've got to be a bit psyched. That exam, you've got to be a bit psyched up, all right? And say, so, no, 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 you've got to be relaxed under pressure. No, you've got to be psyched, you've got to be relaxed, you've got to be psyched, you've got to be relaxed. You get both types of advice, neither is true. It's not about sympathetic uh, 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 activation or even parasympathetic activation. It's not about how, much, how hot the system is or how cold the system is. There's another part of your system 
which really uh, determines your output, which is whether you're in a negative emotional state. So if this is adrenaline and this is a chemical called acetylcholine, ACH, negative emotion, right, underpinned by the hormone cortisol, or positive emotion, underpinned by the anabolic hormones like DHEA, dihydroepiandrosterone, banned substance in the Olympics. You get take, caught taking those tablets, you're out because they're performance enhancers. In the States, this is known as the elixir of youth, the vitality hormone. You can get them on the internet. Right? <laughs> DHEA tablets. Point is, you don't need them. Right? You're, you're 90, yeah, you're 93. Uh, yes, 407. Um, so when you heat somebody's system up, you can heat it up negatively, anxiety, anger, frustration, or you can heat it up positively, passion, right? Uh, determination, focus. The heart rate over here is 120 but erratic. The heart rate is 120 over here but coherent. Both of them have the same heart rate. Both of them have the same amount of adrenaline. That will impair your performance. That will enhance your performance. And passion, as we've heard, is the number one predictor of performance across every aspect of life, including health. If you're passionate about something, you'll do it better. It predicts all types of performance. Similarly, when you cool the system down, relaxation is not necessarily valuable. To, in fact, I've given lectures to you know, some of my medical colleagues entitled, Relaxation Can Kill You. Right? So, you know, that to be, you know, sometimes lecture titles, you know, when I can draw the crowd in. Relaxation, and it can because you can be relaxed and negative. So, apathy, boredom, detachment, indifference, all those kind of things. The heart rate is. Erratic, averaging 50. Now, you can be relaxed, and it can be positive. So things like contentment, curiosity, equanimity, those kind of things. Heart rate, coherent, and 50. So it doesn't really matter whether the heart rate is 50 or 120. What matters is, am I on the left or am I on the right? And so... The secret, really, if you, if you map most, most organizations, is you'll see a rightward skew. That we, people are rightward skewed uh, over here. If you don't believe me, you're going to stand next to the coffee machine, and you will hear the negative hum. Do you know what so-and-so said to me? He didn't say that. That's outrageous. Right? And then you bump into somebody over here, full of the joys of spring. What's up with you? How dare you be that cheerful? You don't realise it's shit. The economy... <laughs> right? And they're trying to drag you back over to here. That's reality. Right? So as a leader, you really... And a large part of the work that we, we do with folks is getting them over here. How do you live your life over here? So somebody referenced Csikszentmihalyi in the zone or the state of flow is about being over here. You know, and how controllable is our emotional performance? So we've got Chris's point. Can we live our life over here? Now, as you've seen, most people haven't got control of their behavior, let alone their thinking, let alone their feeling, let alone their emotional, their physiology. So how do you live your life over here? That's where the training comes in. And we've shown in Neil, right, that when we've taught him how to uh, regulate his physiology, right, that's the start point, the regulation of the physiology will at least get you to the midpoint. You at least get to the midpoint with regulating your physiology. So you'll get to this point just through breathing. So if you learn to breathe properly, you'll at least get to the midpoint. How you get over here is you've got to learn to regulate what emotional state you're in. Now, most people have got no control over that. Their emotional state is dependent on everything outside of them, not on, ins what's, on ins you know, what's going on in the inside. So you've got to learn to train yourself to stay over this side of the thing. But if you take nothing away, at least you can get yourself to the midpoint by learning how to breathe properly. Right? So to help you remember that, think of breathe as an acronym. B stands for breathe. R stands for rhythmically. E stands for evenly. And through the heart every day. So if you breathe rhythmically, evenly, and through the heart every day, you'll at least get to the midpoint. Okay? Thank you. Well done.